Bible 2, Psalms chapter 8, and Proverbs chapter 20. Psalms chapter 8, I'm sorry, Psalms, Psalms, the seventh Psalm, and Proverbs chapter 20. The seventh Psalm, and Proverbs chapter 20. Now, I've been teaching on a series that I entitled The Attitude of the Servant. All of us are supposed to serve God. And we're supposed to serve him how often? How often? I can't hear you. We're supposed to serve him all the days of our lives. And there is going to come a time when we all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. If, we're, if we are Christians, if we're born again, we're going to stand before him and give, a, give an account of the things that we did in our bodies. At that particular time, God is going to reward people. And if you've ever done a study in the Bible about crowns, uh, God has rewards for the people that have done something. And he's going to give you assignments for eternity. So that you will know this, your place in eternity is determined by what you do here the short period of time that you're in the earth realm. You're not in the earth realm very long as it relates to eternity. In fact, the Bible says your life is but a vapor. In other words, it's going to last that long in comparison to eternity, but it's in this period of time that you determine your position for the rest of your existence. So this time is very, very important. That's why he says uh, in the book of uh, Exodus, he says, uh, he told Moses and Aaron that let my people go that they may do what? Serve. That they may do what? Serve. That's always been God's intent for his people that they serve him, that they minister to him, that they have a relationship with him, that they live their lives because of what he's done for them. So you just can't live your life doing what you want to do. Again, Luke chapter 1 says you'll serve him how long? All the days of my life. I can't hear you. So you're going to have to do some personal examination and, um, and you have to be the judge of which, what you've done or what you're doing. Now, in, in the New Testament where he talks about serving, um, the meaning for that word is kind of interesting. It really means to work voluntarily as hard as a slave. That's what literally what serve means in the New Testament. The Greek word is doulos, D-O-U-L-O-S. It means to work voluntarily as hard as a slave. Notice the word voluntarily. He's not going to make you do it. This is something you have to do voluntarily. If you cannot voluntarily serve God, then you don't appreciate what he has done for you. You don't appreciate that he left heaven, he came down here, he walked the earth, he, they all tried to kill him, they tormented him, and they crucified him, he died, he went into the grave, he preached to those that were in the center of the earth at that time, uh, paradise, and then he left there, and those that received him, the Bible says he, left, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Well, the gifts unto men that he gave were the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, the uh, fivefold ministry found in Ephesians chapter 4. And we have the responsibility of teaching you and feeding you what he desires for you to do here in the earth realm. Because when we get there, there's, not, there's going to be a little bit of a difference when we get to heaven. Everybody's looking for heaven. I want to help you know something. Heaven is a temporary place. You're not going to live in heaven forever. You're only going to live in heaven for a very short period of time. And then we're going to come and live. He's going to make a new heaven and a new earth. And we're going to spend eternity here in the earth realm. Okay? But now, in eternity, we're still going to serve him in some capacity. But let me ask you a question. If you knew today that your job throughout eternity would be to sweep the streets of heaven. In other words, you'd be a street sweeper in heaven. Would that make you happy? Amen. Who said yes? I don't want to sweep streets throughout 
eternity. I don't know about you. I think I'd like to do a little bit more than that. I think I'd like to be a little bit more effective than a toilet keeper and a street sweeper, don't you? Huh? Well, just know this, that what you do in eternity determines what you do now. So that's why I have to begin to teach the attitude of a servant because the body of Christ still does not have the attitude that God desires for them to have. Now, your attitude determines your altitude. The attitude that you have will always determine how high you go in life. You got a bad attitude, you're not going very far. In fact, most people don't like people with a bad attitude. In fact, you don't even want to be around people that have a bad attitude. Amen. And you avoid people that have bad attitudes. Amen. You do everything you can to get away from them, even if they're at home. Because nobody likes a bad attitude. Okay? Well, your attitude is your decision. How you act, how you carry yourself is your decision. Now, I want to, want to read a couple of scriptures and then I'll finish integrity today, I believe. I don't think I'll finish it, but I'll just stop. Uh, Psalm 7, look at verse 8. It says in verse 8, The Lord shall judge the people. Judge me, O Lord, according to my what? Righteousness. My righteousness and according to what? My integrity that is what? In me. Integrity is a heart thing. And God always judges our what? Turn to Psalm, uh, Proverbs 20. Proverbs 20, verse 6. Most men will proclaim everyone his own goodness, but a faithful man who can what? Find. A faithful man who can find. The just man walketh in his what? Integrity. His children are blessed after him. Amen? Amen. His children are blessed what? Do you want your children to be blessed? Well, I think integrity has something to do with it. I said in, your integrity has something to do with your children being blessed. Let me say it one more time. Your integrity has something to do with your children being blessed. Now, I'm going to give you four words or four other words. Actually, there's five in the teaching, and I covered one. But there are four very, very important words in life, there's more, but, but four critically important words to determine how well you do in life. Okay? Number one. You got it? Number one, ethics. Ethics. Number two, morality. Number two, morality. Number three, character. Character. And number four, loyalty. And the first one was integrity because it affects all the others. So number one was ethics. Number two was morality. Number three was character. And number four is loyalty. Now, let me tell you what they are before I go on because it's very, very important. And let me make a simple statement. All four or all five words, we get our direction and our meaning from them from the Word of God, not from a dictionary. Okay, because God has a morality that the world doesn't have. God has an ethical standard that the world does not have. In fact, all of those words that I just gave you are wrapped up in one biblical principle called righteousness. Righteousness covers all of them. But let me give you the definitions of, for example, ethics. Ethics simply has to do with right and wrong behavior and decision making. Right, wrong behavior and decision making. While I was in California, I had to do a, had to do a, a, a counseling session with a couple. 
I've known them for many, many years and they were having some challenges and they were thinking about heading for divorce court. So I had to, I loved them so I had to spend some time talking to them. And I loved them so much that I took one of my mornings and we had a counseling session at 6 a.m. from 6 to 10. Because I didn't want them to see, um, see them mess up their life because they couldn't get some direction on how to do what's right. So we, the reason I brought it up is because something came up in the session um, that had to do with what I'm teaching. It has to do with ethics. The man had a point of view. And what you have to understand is God gives us in his word how we're supposed to act. The Bible teaches a man how to be a husband, teaches a wife how to be a wife, teaches the children how to be a children. In other words, every aspect of life for us is covered in the Word of God. But see, he had this, this idea. He had this old-fashioned idea that, you know, his wife was supposed to do what she told him to do, and there was no, in, no, other, no other way about it. You know, you do what I say do. And she was a housewife. He provided for her. He did everything for her. But her complaint was, I don't have a problem with that, but when you come home from work, how about talking to me? but he would never spend any time talking to her. Because you see, he has a very intense job, and I acknowledge that he does have a very intense job. But your very intense job does not mean you separate yourself from your wife. You're the one that decided you want to get married, and I've learned a long time that women like to talk. Amen. Help me out, ladies. Okay, I won't talk about you. I'll talk about this one. This one likes to talk. She likes to talk a lot. Now I've been gone a week. So, being gone a week, she stored up <laughs> a week's worth of stuff. Okay, so I got home late Friday and she fixed me dinner and I got in the bed. I was really tired. And um, so I decided to, she told me to go to sleep early and I did. Um, well, it wasn't early. I got to sleep about 11 o'clock, midnight. And three o'clock in the morning, someone was up, <laughs> moving around. And she wanted to talk. 3 a.m. now. So that means I got three hours sleep. So, you know, we talked. And um, so about eight, nine, she had some place to go. So she got up and she went where she had to go. I went back to sleep because I was tired, you know. No problem. So the day went on. And that night, you know, we, we spent the evening together and, you know, we talked. and. She went, we watched this movie and went to sleep. Again, around midnight. That was last night. And then 3 o'clock in the morning, she popped up again. <laughs> well, all these things that she hadn't gotten out yet. So I think I have three or four days to go, of this to go on, because she hadn't really said anything yet. Because she has all this stuff on the inside. But I've learned, guess what? This is, this is, who I married. Amen. So I don't know about the rest of you, so I, I still have to talk to her. Amen. I still have to listen to all the things that she has to say. Amen. She has to talk about all the different colored nail polishes that she came across while I was gone. <laughs> Whatever. See, none of that stuff is important, but it's important to her. So who does she have to tell about it? You. Me. Okay? So this man said this. He's, he was saying this. He said, she doesn't talk about anything. He says, I got mad because she came home and she wanted to tell me that the nectarines were on sale. <laughs> and he thought he was going to get out and, you know, he thought I was going to side with him. I said, well, how much were they? <laughs> That's what I said. <laughs> how much were they? He said, I don't know. I didn't care about that stuff. I said, you have to care about that stuff, because she cares about that stuff, okay? It may sound minor, but when we, when we start talking about the ethics of life and making good decisions based on uh, who we are, he made a bad decision. He chose to ignore his wife. I said, based on the word of God, you did not do right. So naturally, you've got to give him scripture. But my point is ethics, especially biblical 
ethical principles are critical to us in the body of Christ. Amen. 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 See, the, the world talks about what it wants to see in us. But God says, this is how all men shall know you are my disciples, that you have what? Love, love what? Love. Well, let's start with having love for your wife. You have to have enough love to wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning and talk about nothing. Okay? You just have to do that. Or talk about a recipe that she found. Are you listening to me? It may not seem important to you. But remember, love is not thinking about you. Love is thinking about her. And what she says is important all the time. I don't hear too many men saying amen. I know you get tired of her running her mouth. But this is what you have to understand. And see, I can see some men. I don't, I don't really want to pick on anybody, but I'm being drawn to some people. So I have to kind of stand out here. I have to stand out here because I just, you know, certain things are emanating from a person and you know it. And it's kind of like they're reaching, they want to be preached at. So I'm going to stand away because I don't want to preach at anybody. I want to talk to everybody. Okay? We have to make decisions based on what we're supposed to do based on the Word of God. Amen? amen. I said amen. amen. Men have habits. Women have habits. Yeah. But being married, you have to adjust to one another. Yeah. I mean, that's, this is simple. This is not rocket science stuff. This is real easy stuff. Okay? A man has to love his wife as Christ loved the church. Love means to give. So you have to give her something, even if it's time, even if it's listening. Listening is critical to your wife. Are there any men in the room? I said listening is critical to your wife. Okay, one more time. I said listening is critical to your wife. Okay, I'm going to try it again. If you think you're going to get away, what, what, I got a camera over there. Okay, camera, I'm going to start pointing at some people. And I want you to put the camera right on. Put them up on the screen. And because uh, I'll call you out. Okay, I'm going to say it one more time. I said, listening to your wife is critical. Because that's much better. <laughs> now, watch me. You should put this in your notes. Not just listening, but listening in an interested way. Amen. See, when you show her that you're interested in what she's saying, you show her that you care. That's how they compute that. So if you ignore them or act like you're not paying attention, that says to her, I don't care about you, and I don't care about what you're saying. Amen. Am I right, ladies? Yeah. Huh? Yeah. If he's sitting next to you, just poke him and says, did you hear, Pastor? <laughs> don't poke him. Don't be afraid of him. He ain't going to do, you, do, do nothing to you here. Just poke him. If your husband's sitting next to you, just say, did you hear, Pastor? Look him right now and say, did you hear, Pastor? He's talking to you. Ethics is about making good decisions. I say good decisions. And our decisions are always based on the Word of God. Our decisions are always based on the Word of God. Okay? See, because you won't hear in the world, love your wife as Christ loved the church. You won't hear that in the world. Because they don't know what that means. Most of them don't know who Christ is. Amen. Okay? What's the next word I gave you? Morality. Morality. Now I have to read this. Morality is also about proper behavior, but it is the differentiation, differentiation of intentions, decisions, and actions between those that are good or right and those that are bad or wrong. Our moral code is the system of morality found in the Word of God, the Bible. And it must be taught. You don't learn it automatically. The only way you can learn it is faith come how? By hearing. 
The adjective moral is synonymous with good or right. The, al the adjective immoral is synonymous with right or wrong, uh, with uh, bad or wrong. So moral is good and right. Immoral is bad or wrong. And then there's another word, amoral, which is defined as unawareness, indifference, don't care, disbelief, or rejection of standards. So you have morality, good morality, which is good. You have immoral, which is bad. And then you have amoral, which is they do what they want to do. Now usually, if I say usually, morality has to do with sexual issues. It has to do with behavior in the world as it relates to sexual things. You say, well, how does that creep into the church? Real simple. There was a time when ladies dressed godly in church. They were careful how they came to church dressed. They didn't wear anything too tight. They didn't wear anything too low. They didn't expose any part of their body. Amen? And the most important thing, they were conscious of it. They would get dressed and then have someone check them out to make sure that they looked right when they went to church. Why? They were going to the house of God. They didn't want to expose or, or draw anybody to them. God was the focus. And knowing that men will look at women, you have to be careful how you dress as a woman. Okay, now careful ladies. See, I, I, was, I was gentle with the men, so I, now I'm talking about you for a second. Because, see, these things affect us, male and female. They're ethical principles for the male. They're ethical principles for the female. And all of us have to listen. If we want to learn to do what's right, we have to listen to what thus saith the Lord. Amen. You still with me? Yeah. Okay, now that last word, amoral, is people just don't care. They wear whatever they want to, to church. Short dresses, tight dresses, low cleavage. And you know... <laughs> It's okay if people do that. But let me tell you the bad part. The bad part is the godly people don't say anything. See, if I saw somebody dressed like that, I'd probably have to pull them aside and in love minister to them. I mean, that's what the women should do, but they don't do that anymore because they're afraid they're going to hurt somebody's feelings. You're not going to hurt somebody's feelings if you tell them the truth. You're going to hurt their feelings if you ignore them. And then when they find out the truth, they're going to realize that you weren't the kind of Christian you were supposed to be because you didn't say anything. Amen. Moving right along. <laughs> well, I got somebody listening. Sound like Chloe to me. Was that Chloe? Amen. All right. Character. Character has to do with your inner man and how and the way it relates to who you are. Character has to do with who and what you are, how you carry yourself. Character, there's also decision making as it relates to character, but your character is critical to you, should be. Your character is also how other people perceive you. But other people perceive you based on how you take care of yourself, how you perceive yourself. Do you want to be a person of high character or you just want to be just any old regular person? You don't want to do that. Amen? All right, and the last word is what? Loyalty. Loyalty is the hardest of every word that I've just given you. It's the most difficult and it's the one that people do not aspire to because of the difficulty th that it involves. 
The average Christian is not loyal to anything. Not loyal to God, not loyal to their church or their pastor, um, their job. They're just not loyal. Loyalty is something that has to be taught, taught, and taught. But even when you teach it, the reason people have a challenge with loyalty is because they don't understand what it is. Okay? Loyalty <laughs> has nothing to do, well, I'll just use you here today. Your loyalty to me or to this church has nothing to do with me or this church. That's the best way. I, see, I need to explain loyalty in a way that you understand it. Loyalty only has to do with you and what's on the inside of you and what you choose. No, it says, who makes the choice? I Say, I do. What you choose to be loyal to. Because you see, once you find out what it is, you have to be it. And if you don't choose to be it, you will not be loyal. And most Christians are not loyal. In fact, I'd say 90%, oh, maybe 98% of the Christians are not loyal. Because they bounce around too much. Because they, see, they determine, their loyalty is determined by what they see going on. And if they see something they don't like, they're gone. They hear something they don't like, they're gone. Because they don't understand loyalty. Loyalty has to do with the individual. Not the church, not the pastor. I had an usher that left here. I saw him in the market earlier this year. And uh, the reason he left, he said, because the head usher moved him from his post. <laughs> I looked at him. I said, make sure I understand this. You had a post, and the head, head usher moved you to a different post, and you got mad and left the church. Because y'all was good in my job, and I don't like that job. I said, could it be that the head usher wanted to expose somebody else to that?